Jonathan Small. Mahomet Singh. Abdullah Khan. Dost Akbar. The Four. The Sign of the Four by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dramatized in two parts by Bert Cools, with Clive Merrison as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr. John Watson. The Sign of the Four. Part One Timber Toe. Sherlock Holmes took his bottle from the corner of the mantelpiece and his hypodermic syringe from its neat Morocco case. With his long, white, nervous fingers, he adjusted the delicate needle and rolled back his left shirt cuff. For some little time, his eyes rested thoughtfully upon the sinewy forearm and wrist, all dotted and scarred with innumerable puncture marks. Finally, he thrust the sharp point home and pressed down the tiny piston. Which is it today? Morphine or cocaine? Cocaine. Seven percent solution. Would you care to try it? No, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> perhaps you're right, Watson. Uh, yes, I, I suppose its influence uh, is physically uh, a bad one. You suppose? If you have any doubts in the matter, I should be delighted to dispel them. I find it so stimulating and clarifying to the mind, however, that its, its, its secondary action is a matter of... <laughs> Small moments. Small <laughs> moment. It's a pathological and morbid process. It involves increased tissue change and leaves a permanent weakness. And you know what a black reaction comes on you afterwards. Uh, <laughs> For God's sake, count the cost! My mind rebels at stagnation. You know, give me problems, give me work, give me the most obtruse cryptogram and the most intricate analysis, and I can dispense with artificial stimulants. <laughs> Oh, I crave for mental exaltation. <laughs> and what do you present me with? <laughs> this. A study in scarlet. Yes. Uh, uh, mm. uh, Lucy was silent, but her blushing cheek and her bright, happy eyes showed only too clearly that her young heart was no longer her own. <laughs> Romantic drivel! But the romance was there. I couldn't tamper with the facts. Oh, well, some fact should be suppressed. I can't believe that. The only point in the case which deserved mention was the analytical reasoning I used to unravel it. Oh, I see. Every line should have been about you. And you called yourself a scientific detective. I thought this would please you. I'm sorry. I was mistaken. Roll up, roll up, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. As I live and breathe, and I wouldn't tell you an old lie now, would I? The only one in captivity. The only one ever tamed. The only one ever taken from its own heathen lands and brought into civilization. Don't alarm yourself, madam. It is securely chained up in there. Oh, yes, sir. Bond to the finest British steel. It only ever got out once. And you can all see what happened then, can't you? Oh, yes, exactly. So come along, come on, roll up. Only a penny to see something you remember the rest of your days. Roll up, roll up. Thank you, sir, madam. Thank you. In you go. That's it, madam. In you go. That's it. Oh, Jonathan Small.
Holmes? 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 What is it? I want to ask you something. Well? If I'm to continue as your chronicler, I want to make sure that I present your methods accurately. Yes, good. Observation and deduction. I've heard you say that it's difficult for a man to have any object in daily use without somehow impressing his individuality on it. Yes, yeah, well, give it to me, Watson. I beg your pardon? The object, the test piece, whatever it is. I cannot emulate the music hall mind reader. I do not work blindfolded. <clears throat> Here. Uh, this has recently come into my possession. What can you tell me about its previous owner? Well, I can tell you that his watch has prevented me from taking another dose of cocaine, as you so transparently intended it should. <clears throat> yes, now. Hmm. Mm hmm. Hmm. <sighs> Take it. There are hardly any data. Oh. So what about your theory? Uh, precision, Watson. Hardly any, not none. Uh, subject to your correction, I should judge that the previous owner of that watch was your elder brother, a man of untidy habits, very untidy and careless. He was left with good prospects, but he threw away his chances, lived for some time in poverty with occasional short bursts of prosperity, and finally, taking to drink, he died. That is all I can gather. This is unworthy of you, Holmes. You made inquiries into the history of my unhappy brother. And now you pretend to have deduced the knowledge in some fanciful way. I didn't think you capable of descending to something like that. Oh, my dear doctor. Pray accept my apologies. Viewing the matter as an abstract problem, I never thought how personal and painful a thing it might be to you. I assure you that I never even knew you had a brother until you handed me that watch. Then how did you get those facts? You were correct in every particular. Well, the date of the watch is nearly 50 years back, and it carries the initials H.W. The W obviously suggests your own name. Your father has been dead many years, and jewellery usually descends to the eldest son. Uh, to deduce a brother is no major achievement. That the brother is no longer alive is strongly suggested by the simple fact that you are now in possession of his timepiece. And your insights as to his character? Well, look how the case is dented and scratched. Yes, it's marked all over. It's been kept in the same pocket as, as keys, coins and other hard objects. It's no great feat to assume that only a careless man treats a 50-guinea watch in so cavalier a fashion. The poverty? Open it. And when a pawnbroker takes a watch, he scratches the number of the ticket on the inside of the case. Now, there are no less than four such numbers visible there. Hmm? Inference that your brother was often at low water. Huh? Secondary inference? And that he had occasional bouts of prosperity. Or he couldn't have redeemed the pledge. Exactly. And finally, if you look at the inner plate which contains the keyhole... Uh, here, here. Uh, use my lens. Mm. There are more scratches. Hundreds of them. Hmm. Marks where the key has missed its target. You'll never see a drunkard's watch without them. <laughs> huh. Where's the mystery in all this? You're right. I'm sorry. I should have more faith in your powers. Oh, what's the use of having powers when one has no field upon which to exert them? <laughs> oh, look out there. Was ever such a dreary, dismal, unprofitable world? What could be more hopelessly prosaic and material? Crime is commonplace. Existence is commonplace. And no qualities except those which are commonplace of any function upon Earth. <laughs> but surely... <sighs> Watson? Good night. Tonga. Yes. 
see that light? That's where it is. You know what to do. Up you go, then. And be careful. Come in, Mrs. Hudson. Good news, sir. A client. Oh, thank heaven. A young lady, well-dressed and rather reserved. Uh, I'll tell him. <clears throat> Please wait a moment or two. Then show her up. Yes, Doctor. Let's hope he finds her problem interesting. Amen. Holmes? Holmes? A client? Holmes? I'm going to open this door. Very well. Oh, God. Holmes, there's a client here. A lady. Be out here in two minutes. Come in. Miss Mary Morstan. Ah, please come in, Miss Morstan. I am Dr. John Watson. Mr. Holmes will be here in a moment. Good morning, Doctor. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Yes, thank you. Please, sit down. Thank you. Whatever it is that's disturbing you, I'm sure that Mr. Holmes will be able to help. You're very kind. I've come here because you and Mr. Holmes once acted for my employer, Mrs. Cecil Forrester. Mrs. Forrester? Of Lower Camberwell. She was much impressed by your kindness and skill. It was a very simple case. <sighs> Miss Mary Morstan, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. An exceedingly simple affair. She did not think so. Well, nonetheless. <laughs> well, at least you cannot say the same of my problem. Uh, please continue, Miss Morstan. Briefly, the facts are these. My father was an officer in the 34th Bombay Infantry. Ah. Dr. Watson? The doctor has also served in India. Oh. Yes. Pray continue. My mother died when I was a child, and I was sent home to England to live. I was placed in a boarding establishment in Edinburgh, and I remained there until I was 17. My father obtained 12 months' leave and came home to London, telegraphing me that he had arrived all safe and directing me to come down at once to the Langham Hotel. His message was full of kindness and love. I drove to the Langham and was informed that Captain Morstan had gone out the night before and had not returned. I waited all day, but there was no news of him. And that night, on the advice of the manager of the hotel, I communicated with the police. <laughs> Their inquiries led to no result, and nothing more has been heard of my unfortunate father. He came home with his heart full of hope to find some peace, some comfort, and instead... The date? He disappeared upon the 3rd of December, 1878. Ten years ago? But... What happened to his luggage? It had remained at his hotel. There was nothing in it to suggest a clue. Clothes and books and a number of curiosities from the Andaman Islands. Mm -hmm. Was that his posting? He was one of the officers in charge there. <sighs> it's a penal colony, Holmes. Hmm? Terrible place by all accounts. So Papa used to say in his letters. Uh, well, had your father any friends in town? Only one that I know of, Major Sholto, a fellow officer from the penal colony. The Major had retired some little time before and lived at Upper Norwood. I communicated with him, of course. But he didn't even know that my father was in England. A singular case, eh, Holmes? Mm. I haven't yet described to you the most singular part. Well, then pray do so. About six years ago, a notice appeared in the Times asking for the address of Miss Mary Morstan and stating that it would be to her advantage to come forward. Oh, indeed. Do um, you happen to recall the precise date? The 4th of May, 1882. Okay. Here is the cutting. Oh, very good. Thank you. By that date, I'd entered the family of Mrs Cecil Forrester in the post of governess. 
On her advice, I published my address in the newspaper. Mm. With what result? The very same day. This box arrived in the post. Ah, may I? Thank you. Good heavens. My reaction exactly. I don't believe I've seen a more lustrous pearl. Or a larger. It's beautiful. Since then, every year upon the same date, well, you can see for yourself. That's fascinating. I took them to an expert. They are exactly matched. And of some considerable value. Yes. Yes, but it is not this which brings you to me, Miss Morstan. Something else has occurred. Hmm? Something rather more disquieting than anonymous gifts. You are correct, Mr Holmes. This morning I received this letter. Perhaps you will read it for yourself. Hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, uh, the envelope too, please. Thank you. Yes, postmark London Southwest, July the 7th. Hmm. <laughs> Man's thumb mark on corner, probably postman. Yeah, best quality paper. Envelopes at sixpence a packet. <laughs> this particular man and his stationery. Yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Watson. <clears throat> no address. Be at the third pillar from the left outside the Lyceum Theatre tonight at seven o'clock. If you are distrustful, bring two friends. You are a wronged woman and shall have justice. Do not bring police. Your unknown friend. Hmm. The same hand as the address on the pearl box. Well, this is a very pretty little mystery. Hey, well, what do you intend to do, Miss Morstan? Well, that is exactly what I came to ask you. I shall be guided by your advice. And Mr Holmes, of course. <laughs> Oh, we shall certainly go, Miss Morstan. You and I? <laughs> ah, but your correspondent says two friends, does he not? He does. Mm, well, then, let me think. Uh, well, you and I, and... Uh... <clears throat> Why, Dr Watson is the very man. He and I have worked together before. Oh, Dr Watson, would you come? I should be proud and happy if I can be of any service. You are both very kind. If I'm here at six, it will do, I suppose. Oh, you must not be later. Goodbye, Miss Morstan. Until six, then. Please try to set your mind at rest. I shall. Thank you, Dr Watson. Au revoir, Miss Morstan. Au revoir. Hmm, what a very attractive woman. Is she? Uh, they not observe. You really are an automaton, a calculating machine. <laughs> Watson! There's something <laughs> positively inhuman about you at times. Keep that thing away from me! Watch your mouth, Smith. All right, Tonga. He doesn't like you, Smith, and no more do I. I should be charging you double. You've been well enough paid. Will she be ready? How many times? She'll be ready. And you'll keep her out of sight till then. Do you think I'm some kind of fool? <laughs> keep it away! <laughs> <laughs> I was beginning to think that you were going to be late. And you were looking forward to riding off alone with a decorative, Miss Morstan. I thought you hadn't observed that. Ooh, writing it up already, Watson. More gems for your avid public. <laughs> <laughs> her expression was sweet and amiable, and her large blue eyes were singularly spiritual and sympathetic. In an experience of women which extends over many nations and three separate continents, I have never... <laughs> if you say one word, I swear I walk out of the door. Pour me some tea. There's a good fellow. <coughs> you know, there's no great mystery in this matter. What? You've solved it already? Mm, no, that would be too much to say. I've discovered a, a suggestive fact. Sug that's all. Suggestive fact? Well, actually, a, a very suggestive fact. Major John Sholto, late of the 34th Bombay Infantry... Thank you, Doctor. ...died on the 28th of April, 1882. I may be very obtuse, Holmes, but I fail to see... No. No, wait a minute. Miss Morstan received her first pearl at the beginning of May that same year. Within a week of the death of her father's only friend in England. 
Very suggestive. Now, it's nearly six. Be so good as to bring your heaviest stick. <clears throat> You're anticipating danger? I believe we are in for a serious night's work. I have something else to show you, gentlemen. This is a paper which I found in Papa's things. I've always assumed that it was just another souvenir. But since it is a little out of the ordinary, I thought you might wish to see it. Oh, you certainly are a model clad. Now, this is paper of native Indian manufacture. It has at some time been pinned to a board. Your father evidently held it to be of some importance, for it's been kept carefully in a pocketbook. Yes, that's where I found it. Yeah, one side's as clean as the other, drawn in pencil but almost faded. When I first saw it, I thought it was a pattern, but it's actually a diagram or plan of some kind. Matters Indian are the doctor's territory. Thank you. Yes, I'm sure you're right, Miss Mawson. Let's say that this is a plan of some large and complex building. Interesting, this cross in the centre, eh, Holmes? And the words 337 from left. Uh, I confess to being more intrigued by the inscription at the bottom. <sighs> Strange collection of names. Mm. Jonathan Small, Mohammed Singh, Ab Abdullah Khan, Jost. Akbar. Yeah, one Westerner, two Mohammedans, and uh, what about the fourth, Watson? Oh, it's a sort of Mohammedan Sikh hybrid. Do you know any of these people, Miss Morstan? I'm afraid not. Nor did my father ever mention them in his letters. Oh, what about this symbol? I've never seen anything like it anywhere else. Hmm, oh, why? Four crosses in a line with their arms touching. And written through them... The sign of the four. What do you suppose is going to happen, Mr. Holmes? Uh, patience, Miss Morstan. It is pointless to speculate without data. It's eerie, isn't it? Something ghost-like in the way the light from the shop windows cut through the fog. People walk out of the gloom into the light and then back into darkness again. It's a microcosm of all human life. Oh, Watson, you're an incurable romantic. I agree with the doctor. I hate these steamy, foggy nights. It's past seven. I hope this whole thing isn't some kind of hoax. I believe not. To your left, hmm? small, dark man, dressed as a, as a coachman. He's been watching us carefully. And here he comes. Are you the parties who come with Miss Morstan? I am, Miss Morstan. These two gentlemen are my friends. Uh, you will excuse me, Miss, but I was to ask you to give me your word that neither of your companions is a police officer. I give you my word on that. Uh, this way, please. <laughs> Look at it, Tonga. Look at it. <laughs> After all this time. So we'll be out of this damn place. We can live like kings, like Maharajas, eh? <laughs> We've done it, Tonga. Vengeance for the four. Where do you think he's taking us? Our quest does not appear to lead us to very fashionable regions. The fog's got thicker. I can't see a thing. We're in Robsard Street. Where's that? South of the river. We crossed over Vauxhall Bridge, then turned into Wandsworth Road, then Priory Road, Larkhall Lane and Stockwell Place. Ah, now we're turning again Cold Harbour Lane. Do you know every by street in London by heart, Mr Holmes? It's a hobby of mine. We're stopping. Uh, dull brick houses, new, I think. Hardly any lights. There's a door opening. Someone's coming. Good Lord. Do you see, Holmes? I see. What? Whatever is it? Someone singularly incongruous for the inhabitant of a third-rate suburban dwelling house. Good evening, Miss Morstan. 
Gentlemen, the sahib awaits you. Your servant, Miss Morstan. Your servant. Your servant, gentlemen. Welcome to my little sanctum. Thank you, Kitmutka. Sahib. A small place, Miss Morstan, but furnished to my own liking. An oasis of art in the howling deserts of South London. It's beautiful. It seemed to me that if I could not take myself to India, I could at least bring a little of India to me. Mr Thaddeus Sholto, that is my name. Sholto? Quite so. You are Miss Morstan, of course. And these gentlemen? Mr Sherlock Holmes and Dr Watson. A doctor, eh? Mm. Have you your stethoscope? I have grave doubts as to my mitral valve. Might I ask you, would you have the kindness... Uh, Mr Sholto, this is hardly the time. Perhaps not, perhaps not. Uh, possibly later? You will excuse my anxiety, Miss Morstan. I'm a great sufferer and the heart is so vulnerable. Mr Sholto, why did you not simply ask Miss Morstan to come directly to this address? Hmm? Why all the secrecy? Because I feared she might bring unpleasant people with her. I am a man of retiring and refined taste. There is nothing more unesthetic than a policeman. <laughs> Quite. I seldom come into contact with the rough crowd. I live, as you see, with some little atmosphere of elegance around me. I may call myself a patron of the arts. It is my weakness. That landscape is a genuine coron. Mm -hmm. You will excuse me, Mr Sholto, but... I am here at your request to learn something which you desire to tell me. It is very late, and I should desire the interview be as short as possible. At the best, it must take some time, for we shall certainly have to go to Norwood. To Norwood? To see Brother Bartholomew. He is very angry with me for taking the course which I thought right. I had quite high words with him last night. If we are to go to Norwood, it would perhaps be as well to start at once. Oh, no! Uh, that would hardly do... I don't know what he would say if I brought you to him in that sudden way. No, I must prepare you first. Oh, yes. Then pray do so. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, Miss Morstan, I trust you have no objection to the balsamic odour of eastern tobacco smoke? Uh, oh, thank you. I am a little nervous and I find my hooker an invaluable sedative. Very well. My father was, as you may have guessed, Major John Sholto, once of the Indian Army. He retired some eleven years ago and came to live at Pondicherry Lodge in Upper Norwood. He had prospered in India and brought back with him considerable wealth, a large collection of valuable curiosities and a staff of native servants. We lived in great luxury. We came to realise that some mystery, some positive danger, overhung our father. Mm -hmm. He was very fearful of going out alone and was greatly distrustful of strangers. Yeah. Uh, on one occasion, he actually fired his revolver at a wooden-legged man, a harmless tradesman. Oh. We had to pay a large sum to hush the matter up. Mm -hmm. Early in 1882, my father received a letter from India. <clears throat> my God! What is it, Father? Bad news? <gasps> Father! He had suffered for years from an enlarged spleen, but after this attack he grew rapidly worse, and from that day he sickened to his death. What was in the letter? I do not know. Mr. Sholto. Truly. At the moment of the attack we were too occupied to read it, and afterward my father ordered it destroyed. <sighs> Please carry on, Mr. Sholto. Yes. After a few months, my brother and I were informed that my father was beyond all hope and that he wished to make a last communication to us. Bartholomew, that is. We are here, Father. I have only one thing which weighs on my mind at this supreme moment. Something I have never told you. When we were in India together, my friend, Captain Morstan, and I came into possession of a considerable treasure. Treasure? I have brought it back with me here to England. Here? You brought it to this house? Bartholomew. Yes. 
when Morstan returned home, he came straight here to claim his share. We had a difference of opinion and exchanged heated words. Morstan's heart was weak and his anger was too great for it to bear. He died. Father. Are you all right, Miss Morstan? Yes. Yes, Doctor. I knew in my heart that he was dead. I can give you every information. And what is more, I can do you justice. And will too, whatever Brother Bartholomew may say. Never mind your information. Why was this not reported to the authorities? I cannot say. Mr. Shorto, what was the nature of this difference of opinion? My father did not tell us. What became of Major Morstan's body? I do not know. Your father, sir, behaved in an appalling fashion. Yes, yes, I am afraid he did. Perhaps if I had been there... But Brother Bartholomew and I were away at university. Did Major Sholto tell you anything more about my father? By this time he was extremely weak. He spoke only of you. Of me? You, my sons, you must find Morstan's daughter, his orphan. The cursed greed which has been my besetting sin through life has kept from her what is rightfully hers. Half, at least, of the treasure belongs to that girl. That is, give me that case. Yes, Father. Show me that. No. Oh. Oh. I, I got that necklace out with the design of sending it to her. But I could not bear to part with it. These pearls must be worth a fortune. Uh, it is not one thousandth part of the whole. Swear to me that Morstan's daughter will have her fair share. I swear. Where is this treasure? It has lain hidden all these years. No one else must know. Put your ears down to my mouth. The treasure. Father! Keep him out! I? For God's sake! Keep him out! Oh. No! Oh. Oh. We both stared round at the window. A face was looking in at us, out of the darkness. It was a bearded face, deathly pale with wild, cruel eyes and an expression of concentrated malevolence. My brother and I rushed to the window, but the man was gone. When we returned to my father, his head had dropped and his pulse had ceased to beat. We searched the garden, but found no sign of the intruder, save that under the window, a single footmark was visible in the flower bed. But in the morning... What occurred in the morning? My father's room was found to have been broken into. His cupboards and boxes had been rifled. Was there no clue as to who might have done this? Fixed to my father's chest was this scrap of paper. Neither Bartholomew nor I had ever seen its like before. Yeah, but I have. Hmm? Mr Holmes? Four crosses in a line, their arms touching and written through them. The sign of the four. The journey to Norwood will not take long, and there is only a little more of the story to acquaint you with. For weeks and for months after our father's death, we dug and delved in every part of the garden and the house without discovering the treasure. Over the pearl necklace, my brother Bartholomew and I had some little discussion. Mm. From what you have told us, he seems to have inherited something of your father's attitude. Between friends, yes, you are quite correct. It was all I could do to persuade him to let me send Miss Morstan a detached pearl at fixed intervals, so that at least she might never feel destitute. It was a kindly thought. Oh. It was extremely kind of you. Yesterday, I learned that an event of extreme importance had occurred. 
Brother Bartholomew had found the treasure. I, I instantly communicated with Miss Morstan and then went at once to repeat my views to my brother. Have you seen this treasure? Oh, yes. I, I helped lower the chest from its hiding place. It is very fine. Brother Bartholomew computes its value at not less than one half million sterling. Half a million? Oh. Miss Morstan is certainly one of the richest young ladies in the realm. Oh, oh congratulations, Miss Morstan. <laughs> yes, congratulations. Dr. Watson? Uh, it's glorious news. Yes. And shortly we shall be in Norwood and can demand your share. You have done well, sir, from first to last. Oh. Mr. Sholto, you said earlier that when you met your brother last night, you quarrelled again. Bitterly. I'm afraid we shall not be welcome visitors. What a desolate place. Yeah. This garden must have been lovely once. It looks as though all the moles in England have been let loose in it. It's the traces <laughs> of the treasure seekers. You must remember that we were six years looking for it. But come along. We are expected. Dr. Watson. What is it, Miss Morstan? Oh, nothing. Forgive me. You're trembling. This place, it is the cold. You'll feel better inside the house? Yes. Please try not to be afraid. I am not afraid. Not while you are here. Oh, my dear. Come along. Where are the servants? Try again. Someone's coming. Oh, Mr. Thaddeus, sir. I'm so glad you've come. Mrs. Bernstein, whatever is the matter? Oh, please come quickly, sir. Something terrible's happened to Mr. Bartholomew. <coughs> Brother Bartholomew? Touch nothing! Oh. Oh, what's that smell? This is some kind of laboratory. Mr. Sholto, do not touch him. But... What's up? Excuse me. Oh. He's been dead many hours. Why is he all twisted? Look at his face. What's this paper? Holmes? Yes, I see it. Here. The sign of the four. In God's name, what does it all mean? It means murder. Oh, I cannot stand it. I shall go mad. What is happening? What are you looking for? This. Looks like a thorn. It is a thorn. Uh, be uh, careful. It's poisoned. Things grow darker instead of clearer. Oh, on the contrary. Things clear every instant. <gasps> oh! Now, oh. what is it now? The treasure is gone. <gasps> they have robbed him of the treasure. Do you mean to say it was in this room? Yes. The hiding place was above this very chamber. It has a false ceiling. See, there is the hole through which I helped Bartholomew lower the chest last night. I was the last person to see him. I heard him lock this door as I went downstairs. What time was that? It was ten o'clock. Uh, now he is dead, and the police will be called in, and I shall be suspected. I know that I shall go mad. Yes, you have no reason for fear, Mr. Sholto. No reason for fear. <laughs> Take my advice. Go down to the local station and report the matter to the police. Offer to assist them in every way. We shall wait here until your return. Yes, yes. Huh? I, I shall do as you say. Ah. I am innocent. They will see that I am innocent. I have nothing to fear. Yeah. Has he gone? Yes. <laughs> Isn't this splendid? <laughs> now, Watson, we have half an hour to ourselves. Let us make good use of it. More than one intruder, two. How did they come? How did they go? The door has not been opened since last night. Out of the window, yeah. mm. snibbed on the inner side. Framework is solid, no hinges exposed. Open it. No, no water pipe near, roof out of reach. Ah, single footmark on the sill. Mud from the rain last night. Coil of rope against the far wall. Stout hook. 
Yes, yes. Now the floor. Nothing. Nothing. Ha! What have you found? See, here, and here, and there, by the table. Those are not footprints. No, there's something much more valuable. It is the mark of the timber toe. A wooden stump. Huh? Didn't Sholto mention a wooden-legged man? Yes, it did. The late Major had an aversion to them, if you remember. Oh, my God. With good reason, seemingly. But how did he get in here? Through the window. But it was latched on the inside. I saw you open it. Besides, no one could scale that wall. It's impossible. But suppose you had an ally, huh? A friend with a rope. Uh, this rope. Two men? Hmm. One of whom tied the rope to this hook in the wall. I think if you were an active man, you might swarm up wooden leg and all. Mm, and depart in the same fashion. Oh, very good, Watson. <laughs> Incidentally, our wooden-legged friend isn't a sailor. Now, his hands are too soft. There are flecks of skin and blood on this rope in several places. Well, what about this ally? Yes, the ally. Oh, he lifts the case from the regions of the commonplace. I fancy that this ally breaks fresh ground in the annals of crime in this country. How hmm. came he into the room? The door was locked, the window was inaccessible. Hmm. There wasn't a chimney, the grate is far too small. Yes, yes, well then. Huh? I can't see it. Oh, yes you can, but you will not apply my precept. How often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must, must be, be the, the truth. truth. Yeah. He came through the hole in the ceiling. Of course he did. Now, we shall now extend our researches to the room above, the secret attic. I fancy this ladder must have been in place here. Mm, I'll pass you up the lamp when you're in position. Thank you. <coughs> Bring the lamp up. Careful, it's filthy. Is that a trapdoor? Yeah, it's onto the roof. Oh, yes, it opens far too easily. Look at the hinges. The rust is nearly fallen away. Mm, so it's been opened recently. But it's just a ventilator. Could you get through there? I don't believe so. I certainly couldn't. Yes, but somebody could. Now let's see if we can find some other trace of our allies' individuality. In this dust, it shouldn't be difficult. <laughs> ah! What is it? Just here. A clear print. Hold up the lantern. You see? Holmes, a child has done this terrible thing. Workman, I want one of you at the top of the stairs and one outside the room. Right. If Sholto confesses, I want to hear about it. Straight away. Right. Well, here's a business. Here's a pretty business. Hello. Who are you two? I think you must recollect me, Inspector Othelny Jones. <laughs> Why, of course I do. It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the theorist. I'll never forget how you lectured us all on inferences and effects in the Bishopsgate jewel case. Mm. Well, it's true you set us on the right track, but you'll own now that it was more by good luck than good guidance. It was a piece of very simple reasoning. Oh, come now, come, come, come. Never be ashamed to own up. But what is all this? The bad business. Stern facts here. No room for theories. Lucky I happened to be at the station when the message arrived. And who are you? Dr. John Watson. Oh, a medical man, are you? Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think he died of? Yeah, this is hardly a case for us to theorise over. No, no. <laughs> Still, we can't deny that you hit the nail on the head sometimes. Door locked, I understand. Jewels missing. Well, how was the window? Uh, fastened, but there are marks on the sill. Well, if it was fastened, the marks have nothing to do with the matter. Common sense. Hmm. Oh, I have a theory. These flashes come upon me at times. Uh, what do you think of this? Sholto was on his own confession with his brother last night. The brother died in a fit on which Sholto walked off with the treasure. How's that? And then the dead man very considerately got up and locked the door from the inside. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. well, there is a flaw there, but uh, I'm weaving my web around Thadia Sholto. The net begins to claw. You are not quite in possession of all the facts yet. No? No. This thorn... Uh, well, let me examine it. ...which I firmly believe to be poisoned... Uh, well, yes, well, uh, better wait for the police doctor. It was in the dead man's neck. You don't say well, uh, you put it down uh, somewhere safe, um, over there. And this paper, inscribed, as you see it, was on the table. Uh, yes. It's, it's perfectly harmless. <clears throat> the sign of the fall. How does that all fit into your theory? <laughs> it confirms it in every aspect. Oh, yes, oh, yes, um... Constable, I'll Sir? bring up Mr. Sholto. Sir? Yes, Doctor, this is the very proof I need. The house is full of curiosities. Who better to leave these things than the man who used to live here? The only question is, how did he depart? Now. Now. Uh, I... Jones? Well, what is it? More reasoning? The solution to this problem is over your head. Now then, Mr. Holmes, there's no need for you. Oh. <laughs> yes, there's a hole in the ceiling. Oh, well done, Inspector. And a ladder. In here, in here, Constable. Right there. I tell you, Constable, I had nothing to do with it, Inspector. Mr. Sholto, it is my duty to inform you that anything which you may say will be used against you. No. I arrest you in the Queen's name as being concerned in the death of your brother. Didn't I tell you, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson? Don't trouble yourself, Mr. Shorter. I think that I can engage to clear you of this charge. Don't promise too much, Mr. Theory. Not only will I clear him, Mr. Jones, but I will make you a free present of the name and description of one of the two people who were in this room last night. His name, I have... Every reason to believe is Jonathan Small. He is poorly educated, active, with his right leg off below the knee and wearing a wooden stump. He's middle-aged and has probably been a convict. There's a good deal of skin missing from the palms of his hands. The other person... Oh, yes, oh, yes, the other person... ...is a rather curious individual. <laughs> Take him away, Constable. Sir. No! Pity. Come along now, sir. Please, I had nothing Don't to do with it. Well, I've got my man. Good night to you, gentlemen. Good morning to you, Inspector. Huh? Ah. <laughs> that man is a fool. Oh, he has occasional glimmerings of reason. And you remember the old French philosopher. There are no fools so troublesome as those that have a little wit. <laughs> Very little in his case, I'd have thought. <laughs> Good old Watson. Holmes, hmm? how could you describe this wooden-legged man with such confidence? And what evidence is there to link him to the Jonathan Small whose name appears on that old map? Simplicity itself. Uh, you'll recall the care with which Captain Morstan preserved that map. Mm -hmm. A link to the treasure is highly probable, particularly in view of the cross and other directions. Indications as to its original hiding place. Clearly, the four men who signed the document were also involved in the whole business. And of the four names, only one could possibly fit the dramatic face at the window that so hastened the late Major's demise. Why only one? Friend Thaddeus described the face as deathly pale. There was one Western name and three Indian. Who else could it have been? This is mere speculation. Oh, on the contrary. It's the only hypothesis which covers the facts. Major Sholto was living in fear. On at least one occasion, he attacked a one-legged man, a white man, mark you. It's no great feat to put these facts together with Sholto's old command of a convict guard and come up with the ex-prisoner, Jonathan Small. Well, what sort of a monster is this, Small? Using a child as an accomplice. Not a child, Watson. Not a child, but that footprint was tiny. And when you couple that with great agility and poisoned darts? Good God. A savage. A savage. It's incredible. Holmes, there may still be danger. It's not right that Miss Morstan should remain in this house. Our pair have flown. Nothing remains for them here. There's no danger now. Oh, good. But even so... I agree. You must escort her home. With pleasure. 
She lives in Camberwell, so it's not far. You're not accompanying us? What? Do you wish me to do so? Oh, I believe I can manage on my own. Oh, I'm, I'm certain of it. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll wait here and have a word with the servants. Hmm. You're not too tired to drive out again? By no means. Ah. I want to see this matter through. Excellent, excellent. Hmm. Ah. And we've had a stroke of luck. Mm -hmm. The smell you remarked on was creosote. There's a carboy of the stuff in that corner. It's cracked and leaking. And that's lucky? Oh, extremely. Our friend, the ally, has had the misfortune to tread in it. <laughs> now, after you've dropped Miss Morstan, go to this address and ask for Toby. Toby? Yeah. Uh, I'd rather have his help than that of the whole detective force of London, man. Ah, a dog. Yes. <laughs> In the meanwhile, I shall study the methods of the great Jones. Oh, here's a business. Here's a pretty <laughs> business. <laughs> Holmes? Huh? My dear fellow? Extraordinary, isn't it? Just this morning, you were complaining that everything on the planet was commonplace. And you could think of nothing but myself poisoning by cocaine. Yeah. And Miss Morstan had not yet come to both our rescues. What do you really think of her? Uh, Watson, a client to me is a mere unit, a factor in a problem. I think, my friend, that she is one of the most charming and capable young ladies I have ever met. And one of the wealthiest. <laughs> Take her home, Watson. Dr. Watson? Yes, Miss Morstan? What is the matter? Why won't you talk to me? Please tell me, have I offended you in some way? No. Earlier tonight, in the garden, when you took my hand. It is forward of me to speak this way, I know it, but I thought... I should not have done it. Forgive me. Forgive you? What are you saying? I had no right. No right? If you had not done it, if you had not been there, I should have fled from that terrible house. It was your presence that gave me strength. What is there to forgive? Miss Morstan. Yes? Uh, um, I'm sorry. I can't explain. You must not ask me to. I'm so sorry. I'm not generally given to bursting into tears. You must think me a weak, stupid woman. On the contrary. I know you to be nothing of the kind. You're suffering from a mild case of delayed shock. It's entirely understandable after what you've been through. Thank you. And for escorting me home. There's a light still on. Someone has waited up for you. Yes. Probably Mrs. Forrester. Miss Morstan. Yes? You must not think me unfeeling. I think you are very kind and very troubled. If I can help. I... I do not believe so. If you should change your mind... Good night, Dr. Watson. Good night. How could I obtrude love upon her at such a time? She was tired and vulnerable, shaken in mind and nerve. And worse still, she was rich. 
If Holmes's researches were successful and the treasure recovered, she would be an heiress. Was it fair? Was it honorable that a half-pay surgeon should take advantage of an intimacy which mere chance had brought about? Might she not think me a mere vulgar fortune seeker? I could not bear to risk that such a thought should cross her mind. I stole a glance back, and in my mind I still seem to see that picture, the graceful figure on the step, the half-open door, the hall light shining through stained glass, the barometer, and the bright stair rods. It was soothing to catch even that passing glimpse of a tranquil English home in the midst of the wild, dark business which had absorbed us. Then the carriage turned corner, and it was gone. We rattled away through the silent, gaslit streets. That was part one of The Sign of the Fall by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, dramatized in two parts by Bert Cools, with Clive Merrison as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr. John Watson. Jonathan Small was played by Brian Blessed, Mary Morstan by Moya Leslie, Thaddeus Sholto by Richard Tate, and Inspector Jones by Sean Probert. Anna Cropper played Mrs. Hudson, Michael Kilgariff, Major Sholto, Amajit Dew, Khan, and John Bull, Bartholomew Sholto. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Alexander Balanescu. The Sign of the Four was directed by Ian Cottrell and the producer was David Johnston.